you know, we could say like, are you going to wait for long? Apparently, yes. Ah, why look? <laughs> long time no see. Just draw your guess that. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. No, long time no see. Something like that. Yeah. I recently learned how to be naive, so how to open Tian means basically long time no see. And I thought, oh, what a coincidence. The Chinese say essentially long time no see, just like we do. And then I learned we got it from Chinese. We actually picked it up from Chinese immigrants. <laughs> or and the British, I guess, in China. No, I guess it was British in China or whatever. So they, they picked it up from the Chinese. So we say long, long time no see because Chinese people do. It wasn't a coincidence at all, interestingly enough. Um, so anyway, I'm going to start with two things. One, because I keep getting asked about problem 2.5, how to start. This, this thought comes under to multiple people who Ask me about you know, like man, do I really how you know what should I do here? This comes under the under practical advice. So that's one where you're given that the wave function is this linear combination of the first incite of the of the ground state and the first excited state in the infinite square well, and you're supposed to normalize it. Now, of course, we know one way to normalize is to do this, right, takes i star psi and integrate it over all x. Um, but often that's not the best approach uh, because we also know that the probability of getting any given energy measurement would be Cn absolute square. So we know that the sum of the probabilities has to be one, right? The sum of the Cn squares has to be 1. Well, the, the expansion in general, right, if I'm writing psi of x is the sum of the cn psi n, well, if you start, you know, let's, let's write it out. Well, that's c1 psi 1 plus c2 psi 2 plus c3 psi 3 plus, you just keep doing that forever and you're done. So, c1 is the coefficient of psi 1 in the expansion. C2 is the coefficient of psi 2. C77 is the coefficient of psi 77. And so I ask you, in this expansion, what's C1 equal to? It's A, right? The thing that multiplies, I mean, you know, it's still there, right? The thing that multiplies psi 1 is A. So that must be C1. What's C2 equal to? A. What's C3 equal to? Zero, right? There ain't no C3 there, right? Zero multiplies psi 3 there. Three, zero, two, C infinity is exactly. That's right. C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's 20, 2977. C177 quadrillion, whatever. Those are all zero. Uh, so C1 and C2 are both one. So what's the normalization condition show up as here? 2a squared is 1. a squared plus a squared is 1. Solve for a, because that's what you're supposed to do, normalize by solving for a. a squared plus a squared is 1. Solve for a. If you're given an expansion, that's always going to be the way to normalize it, is use this fact. Just add up the squares of all the coefficients and set it equal to 1. That's going to be much easier than trying to set up an integral in order to do it. Could you do the integral? Sure. Now, the other thing I'll point out is, this wouldn't be that hard to do with the integral if you don't insist on actually writing psi 1 is root 2 over a sine of pi x over a, and psi 2 is root 2 over a sine of 2 pi x over a. Sure, you can do that and integrate, but burn this into your brain. <clears throat> what is that equal to? One, what is that equal to? <laughs> one, I jumped ahead. What is psi 77 star psi 402 dx integrate? Two, zero, right? Don't write out what the wave functions actually are and ask Mathematica how do I integrate 
integrate sine squared with blah, 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 or whatever, and how do I integrate sine pi x over a times sine 2 pi x? No, use the fact that the wave functions have been nor normalized, ortho or they're orthonormal, and then just use the integral 1 if it's the same wave function, 0 if it ain't the same wave function. So it really wouldn't even be hard to do this using integrals either, because you would just write down generically, psi 1 squared dx is 1, psi 2 squared dx is 1. And the cross term to psi 1, psi 2 integral dx, that's going to be 0. And it, it does, you know, true for the infinite square well, true for, you know, the, the Fred potential, where Fred made up some potential, it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter. The, the form of the, they've been normalized, you normalize them, that's what you would use. And you're just wasting time if you actually write out what they are and end up proving that they're orthonormal because they're orthonormal. So that's, that's what you want to keep in mind. Okay, any questions? Now, I said last time that I was going to launch myself off a cliff, start flapping my wings and see if I flew, oh and I went, <laughs> all right. No, but, but then, of course, without the pressure of everyone staring at me, I soared, I flew, it was wonderful. So yeah, let's, let's go back to that actually, and, and show what I was actually trying to get at last time. So, um, we said psi of x and t should be a sum of separable solutions. And let's go ahead and say we're going to call the coefficients dn of t, and then <clears throat> generically we could say let the eigenfunctions of the operator in question be called phi n of x. And then I'm, for now I'm just going to reserve psi n to mean eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. Phi n means arbitrary eigenfunctions of some arbitrary operator q. where the phi sub n of x are the eigenfunctions of some operator q. Or in other words, q applied to phi n of x just gives some number q sub n times phi n of x. Yes? Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes you put hacks on operators, and sometimes you don't. If it makes you feel better, sure. Okay, I'll put a hat on it to indicate that it's an operator. There. And then people think, what, the unit vector q? <laughs> yes, it's physics, not chemistry. Well, even chemists will often put hats on their operators. Well, here, how about this? <laughs> dx, 
and now our knees jerk as we say, wait, that integral of phi m star phi n, because those are the eigenfunctions of an operator, and by hypothesis, any physical operator has a complete orthonormal set of eigenfunctions, what's that integral equal to? Delta m n, the Kronecker delta. So this is delta m n, which is only going to be 1 or 0, and it's 0 except when m is equal to n, so the only thing that lives in this whole summation is d sub m of t. Oops. My poor little integral didn't know what to integrate with respect to. Just sitting there lost, crying, but I fixed it. So now, conclusion, well, change this, change the name back to n again. Conclusion, d sub n as a function of time is the integral phi n star x psi of x and t dx, and that holds for all times. Now, if you don't already know what the solution is, this isn't a practical way to figure out what dn of t is. So it's true, I didn't claim it's useful, but it's true. That this, is, that this is so. Um, and in particular, if I want some particular time t, and I know the wave function at that time, I'm free to do that. Like I could say dn of 0, if I knew the wave function at time 0, I could plug in psi of x 0, do this integral, and get dn of 0. And that's what we were basically saying before, is if you know the initial wave function at time t equals 0, plug in t equals 0 into this expression, and you'll get the coefficient at that time. Um, or any time t naught. If you happen to know the wave function, it's some snapshot of time t naught, some initial time t naught. You know the initial value of this coefficient, but as we're about to show, only if you're looking at the Hamiltonian does dn of t have a simple time dependence, otherwise it's got a complicated time dependence. Did you have a question? Or did I end up answering it by <coughs> No, I was just stretching. You're what? You're just stretching. Oh, that happens to me a lot. The problem is when you do that, like a talk. Oh, I don't think she's stretching. Yes? So it's free of m, it's just any free of m? Well, yeah, it's, well, it's, remember, the, uh oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's a very good point. That is supposed to be an n right there. Yeah, is that what you were asking? Yeah, that's very, very important, yeah. Yeah, the n of t is, oh, pick some random m. No, that would be ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, over here, the Mary of t is phi Mary star of x, psi of x and t dx, right? So if we change Mary to Nancy, then, you know, we got to be consistent, yes, with the subscripts there. Very important point, and I'm glad you pointed that out. It's really easy to mess up subscripts. So actually assume I probably messed up the subscripts. Don't assume that you're just not understanding it. I probably just goofed in a situation.
bear with me here because I'm, I'm, I'm about to launch into a little tirade about exactly that issue. Okay, um, so that's actually, that's actually essentially where I was going. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to clarify here, yeah. So, so bear with me here, because I think I'm actually going to answer your question that you're trying to formulate. That's what I'm after here is to do that. So, now, if Q is equal to H, saying it's enough. True, but not useful since we don't actually know what psi of x and t is. Psi of x and t is what we're trying to find, but it's still true. Let's plug this version of psi of x and t into our general formula. So, d sub n of t, in terms of eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, is going to be uh, the integral of psi n star of x, psi of x and t dx, right? Because in other words, for the Hamiltonian, the phi's are the size, the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So our generic eigenfunctions are the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So dnt is eigenfunction of the operator q, which is h, so we're calling it psi sub n of x. Plug in the expansion, sum over m of cm 
general case. So it looks just like what I did before, except instead of psi n star of x right here, I'm going to have phi n star of x right there. Phi n star of x, psi of x and t is the sum over m of cm, psi m of x e to the minus i e m t over h bar, all that integrated dx, looks just like before except phi replaces psi. Again, we assume that the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. Dr. Neunermacher is staring at me in my head right now, and I am sticking my tongue out at him. <laughs> so this turns into a uh, sum of the cm e to the minus i e m t over h bar, integral of phi n star of x, psi m of x dx. And what is that integral equal to? Quick question. Who the hell knows, right? I mean, it depends on what phi is. And what's, who knows? We can't do this anymore. They're not, the, the eigenfunctions of different operators aren't orthogonal to one another. The eigenfunctions of the same operator are orthogonal to one another. So this is equal to, who knows? Well, at least not until you do the integral. It's not anything in particular. In other words, the sum doesn't collapse anymore. It doesn't collapse to a single term anymore. And that's the whole point. So, what we can do is say, whatever that is, we don't know what it is, but if we do the integral, we can find it out. Other than the tricky part about <laughs> most integrals are undoable, but you know, you know, numerically do it. It exists, even if it's hard to calculate. So, call.
it's a complex Fourier series, but they work perfectly well. And in fact, since the n of t is complex, the Fourier series better darn well be the complex Fourier series. Is it time dependent when you use the eigenfunctions of Fred the operator? Yes. But is there a difference? Yes, because what about dn of t absolute square, which gives the probability of getting the wave function in question at some later time t? It's quite real. Uh, see, now, it's always real, but when you just got this one term here, you're in fact c, because For the case of Q equals H, we get Cn e to the minus i en t over h bar absolute square when we figure out how does the square of d, the absolute square of d, depend on time. Oh, well, that's just going to be Cn star Cn. E to the, just to get really pedantic here, e to the plus i e n t over h bar, e to the minus i e n t over h bar equals just good old c n squared. In other words, the thing that multiplies the exponential is the thing that gives you the probability, and that just sits there. It doesn't change when you're dealing with the Hamiltonian here. Whereas, for the general case, you get a god-awful mess. Which we can in fact, which we can separate into a time-independent term, but oops, there's also a time-dependent term. If we take in this case, we've got this sum. So what I have to do is write dn of dn of t. Uh, actually, I'll leave it as an M here because I made it an M here and I'm going to confuse myself with it. I've changed its name. DM of T absolute square is going to be DM of T star. Uh, D, no, wait, this is D, did I screw No, DM of T. Yeah, yeah, my DM. See, there I'm going again. Mary and Nancy are just like confusing me in my head there. DM of T, okay. If I take the star of this expression, what do I do? Yeah, change f to f star, because it could be complex. Change this to a plus in the exponential there. But since I'm going to multiply by dn of t, I need to change the name of the summation variable, because otherwise I won't be counting every possible cross term there. And since some variables are dummy variables anyway, I could have changed this to q or p or fred or whatever. I will rename it p because I don't like P's actually, but whatever. Um, so, sum over P of F N P star E to the plus I E P T over H bar, multiplying by sum over M, F N M, E to the minus I E M T over H bar. So notice, n stays the same in both, because n is just a fixed number here. It's not changing. But I have two sums, one over p and one over n. And what I can do is, I can generically write then the double sum over n of m and p of all this crap. But what is convenient to do is break it into two, two things. The sum where m and p are equal to one another, so the sum over m equals p, so when they're both 1, and they're both 2, and they're both 3, and then another sum for all the cases where they're not equal to one another, where 1 is 2 and the other is 6, or 1 is 704 and the other is 1,433,704, all those different possibilities. So this turns into, well, when m is equal to p, then this will be, pick your, pick 1, I could call it m, or I could call it p here, f and p absolute square, because if m and, well, I'll call it m here, f and m, it wouldn't matter, f and m absolute square, because if m is equal to p, then this is f 
FNM star FNM, which is FNM squared, and then e to the plus i e m t over h bar, e to the minus i e m t over h bar, which is 1, right? Some other combination. What makes the Hamiltonian special? 